In this video, we're going to look at middleboxes and how they add features and complexity to the core of the internet. Let's get started. Well, we've talked about some specific middleboxes already, such as NAT. In this video, we're going to be looking at the broader implications of middleboxes as a concept, as well as some types we haven't seen yet. First, a definition. When we say middlebox, we mean a box that's in the middle of the network, as opposed to at the edge, but is performing functions usually reserved for edge devices. Typically, when we say this, we have in mind boxes that incorporate some sort of layering violation where they are modifying or taking action based on layers higher than layer three in the core of the network. While the internet was designed with the principle of simplicity in the core in mind and keeping intelligence at the edge, in practice, IP doesn't provide all of the features that we want from the core of the network. And so various middleboxes have been developed to add these features. This is especially true when it comes to implementing security in the network. Let's look a little bit at the prevalence of middleboxes. Probably the most prevalent type of middlebox is NAT, Network Address Translation. And as a reminder, NAT is a middlebox because it changes the port numbers in the transport layer header, even though the transport layer is only supposed to be manipulated at the end hosts. In addition to NATs in your home providing private addresses, many cellular ISPs also run NAT, so you may find that your mobile device is operating behind a NAT. Also, many institutions, such as universities or enterprises, run NAT for their whole organization in order to reduce the number of public IP addresses that they need to purchase. Another common type of middlebox is a firewall. And note that while the same device may provide both a firewall and a NAT, these two are not synonymous. They provide distinct functions. Firewalls typically block traffic based on specific properties, which may consist of layer three or layer four header fields, or even properties of the application layer. Intrusion detection systems are another type of security middlebox, which may go much further than looking at individual packets and examine flows for behaviors that is not recognized or deemed nefarious. Another type of middlebox are those concerned with traffic engineering or load balancing, which may look at properties of the traffic beyond the layer three destination to determine how to forward it. Then there can be application specific middleboxes or gateways that perform particular optimizations to the traffic. One example of this is mobile networks that reduce the quality of images or videos on the fly in between the content provider and the mobile device. We've also mentioned caching, and while some of the caching is handled at the application layer explicitly, such as DNS caching, which does not require a middlebox, other caches happen transparently in the network by intercepting traffic without the source or destination being aware of it, and may result in the application receiving old or outdated information without knowing it. In general, middleboxes operate outside of the standardized protocol operations, and initially much of the behavior was proprietary and closed source. As the use of middleboxes has become more ubiquitous, there's also been progress on opening this up so that, at least in some cases, more is known about what's happening inside the middlebox. As we've seen with software-defined networks, an open flow switch certainly has the ability to behave as a middlebox or as strictly a layer three router or a layer two switch. Another phenomenon that has been growing recently is that of network function virtualization or NFVs. So what does this mean for the architecture of the internet? The architecture was specifically designed with IP as a thin waste of the internet sometimes drawn as this hourglass diagram, where there could be lots of different underlying technologies and lots of different transport layers and application protocols. And these things could be modified and changed independently of IP and the core of the internet. So this one IP layer had to be implemented by all of the devices that connected to the internet, but by keeping it simple, that wasn't too onerous a requirement. Then those devices could implement the protocols they chose out of the other layers because they're not necessarily required. However, what's happened is the core of the internet has gotten bloated with middleboxes, which add complexity to the core and may cause incompatibilities with particular protocols above or below the IP layer. So let's contrast this with RFC 1958. This says that the goal of the internet is connectivity and that the tool for this is the internet protocol and that to the extent possible, intelligence is implemented at the edge rather than hidden in the middle of the network. And this allows for the things that have made the internet as successful as it is, including simple connectivity, IP everywhere, and keeping complexity at the edge. Related to this is the end-to-end -end argument, which says that while some functionality can be implemented at multiple places, either in the middle of the network or at the edge, other things must be implemented at the edge to work correctly. For example, we've seen how reliable data transfer works at the transport layer, meaning it's implemented at the edge. It would certainly be possible for a network layer to implement a hop-by-hop -hop reliable data transfer with acknowledgements and pipelining happening between each router hop. However, there's always the possibility that some error would be introduced along the way, 
even something like a bit flipping in a router's memory where the packet is buffered. And so the end-to-end -end layer would still have to implement the reliability even if it were offered at the network layer as well. For this reason, implementing reliability at the network layer would generally be redundant, and so it is left out of the IP network layer. The rationale for providing encryption only on an end-to-end -end basis is similar. We can compare this with the telephone network. The telephone network took the opposite approach. The handsets at the edge were dumb devices with no intelligence built in, initially without even dialing, and even once the dialing was implemented, it was a very simple signaling mechanism. All the intelligence was in the core of the network. However, we should note that the service provided by the telephone network was roughly the same throughout its lifetime. There was certainly no innovation happening by outside users at the edge, and one would have to say that the innovation that happened in the core of the network did not provide dramatically different services over time. This is in contrast to the design of the internet, where the service provided by the core of the network was intentionally very simple, and the users were allowed flexibility to innovate and develop new services that would run over this simple core. Over time, however, more intelligence has been put into the core of the network in the form of middle boxes, which while it allows the core of the network to offer more services, it also limits the sorts of changes that can be made from the edge only. And that wraps up our discussion of the data plane. We had an overview of the network layer, as well as looking at the details of what's inside a router and how it works, both the v4 and v6 versions of the IP protocol. Then we looked at software-defined networking and OpenFlow, and wrapped up in this video looking at middle boxes. Much of what we looked at in this chapter strongly depends on what we're going to see in the next chapter, meaning the control plane. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.